Greetings, pilgrims. This is Rich, and welcome back to Shadowrun Hong Kong. We've reached the sweet level of the hotel. We've left Deccon behind, and the band is back together. So let's see if we can go ahead and find Rhombus and get to the bottom of what exactly is going on here. Can't go through that door. Room 202. And looks like this is our destination right here. So let's see what's going on. And there's Rhombus. Let's have a little chat. Locate and trap Rhombus. As you burst through the door, you find yourself standing face to face with a small, heavily tattooed man. Geometric shapes of all descriptions trace their way from his temples down his cheeks and neck to his shoulders. His eyes continue the motif. Each of his irises is a slanted rectangle. Oh, that's cool. Rhombus looks at Iso and sighs. If he's surprised to see her, he doesn't show it. You finally want him back, huh? The memories that we locked away? I always knew that you would one day, but you got so hostile after the procedure, I didn't think you'd come around this soon. Iso glowers at him, her cheeks darkening. Oh, get bent, Rhombus. I got hostile with you because you got hostile with me. Like hell I did. I tried to give you some advice. As a friend. If memory serves, you called me a patronizing bastard and slagged my deck. Was I just supposed to take that without punching back? Whoa. Iso, you slagged his deck? Iso cuts in, her normally small voice growing raucous. I called you a patronizing bastard because that's what you were being. You wouldn't have taken that tone if I were a guy, or an orc, or troll. You talk down to me like I was your little sister or something. Well, guess what? I'm not. Whoa, hold up. I talk that way to you because... This really has a different tone than I thought it'd be. She shouts over him, cutting him short. Also, punch back? That's a funny way of putting it. You tailored an ESP to troll all of my posts on Shadowland. What kind of prick would do a thing like that? His face goes beet red and his chest puffs out. The kind whose cat you had killed, you little monster. Captain Whiskers was just a house cat. He didn't have anything to do with this. Iso? Did you kill Captain Whiskers? She rears back in indignation. That wasn't me. I would never hurt a cat. If I were going to have someone killed, it would have been you. Um. Okay, pipe down, both of you. We're going to hash this out together. This is completely different than what I thought was going to happen. You're the muscle, I take it? You and your jarhead friend over there? He nods at Duncan. She brought you along to beat the information out of me, huh? It's just a job. Nothing personal. He scoffs at Iso and wrinkles his nose in disgust. Typical. Hmm. I'm just a man with a job. And Iso tells me that you have something that can help me do it. I can't believe this is happening to me. All over me trying to do you a favor. He shakes his head at Iso. That'll teach me to try and give a friend some advice, I guess. That's the second time you've said that. This whole feud started over you trying to give Iso advice? Yes! I don't even remember what we were talking about. I think... Uh, maybe I was telling her what kind of ram to pick up for a deck? Something like that? It was a long time ago. It wasn't what you said, Rhombus. It was how you said it. She stares up at him, fuming. And the argument was nothing. It was what you did after the argument that was unforgivable. Taking the moral high ground isn't going to work for you here. You attacked me first. And for no reason. Well, we can advance on Rhombus, but I kind of want to find out what's going on here. Okay, from what I'm getting here, you both hate each other. But you were friends, right? Once, I guess. You guess? You let me perform amateur brain surgery on you. Hell, you begged me to. We were friends, Iso. Good friends. And then you went and messed it all up. Amateur brain surgery? Please explain what that means. What the hell has this been about? My memories. The ones about my childhood. The ones that I'd lost. 
They aren't gone. They're in headwear storage, locked away behind an encryption key. I've got them, but I can't see them without it. That was your idea, Ease. Keeping them, I mean. You told me to hold on to the key for you just in case you ever needed them back. I know, Rhombus, but after everything that had happened, I couldn't just ask you to... You want the encryption key for the memories that we locked away? It's yours. I don't envy you the pain that you'll feel when you unlock them, and they belong to you. He keys a series of buttons in on his PDA. ISO's PDA buzzes a moment later. There, check your inbox. You've got the key. Do with it what you will. I was holding on to it for you anyway. ISO blinks confusedly. But I... I thought that we were enemies now. We were. But there was no reason for us to be. Just take the key and go. Have a nice life. He waves her off and he looks exhausted. Let's say nothing and see what Iso, how Iso reacts. Iso stares at Rhombus, a neutral expression on her face. And finally, she speaks up. I'm sorry, Rhombus. I don't know how things got as bad as they did, but... Sorry. Her voice goes solemn. I'm going to find out what happened to Captain Whiskers. I promise you that. Yeah, we need to find out what happened to Captain Whiskers. I will so go on that job. That'd be nice of you, Ease. I appreciate it. Almost bashfully, his gaze filts to the ground. He looks away and color surges to his cheeks. Oh, and he's... I've, uh... I've got something of an admission to make. She rolls her eyes. Look, I get it, Rom. You've always liked me. I hate to break it to you, but it was never that big of a secret. And I know that's why you... His eyes go wide. He raises his hands, palms out, and shakes his head. What... No, he's... No, that's not all... That's not it at all. I mean, you're a nice girl and all, but... Just... No. Color rushes to her cheeks. But then... What? My panic button. He flips his sleeve inside out, and you can see a blinking red LED embedded in the fabric. I tripped it when you broke in. The cops are on their way. But, but wait, don't freak out. I'll call them off for you. Thank you, Rambus. Oh... She shuffles her feet and looks away. Uh, thanks. Hey, what are friends for? You just wait here. I'll go meet them in the hall and draw them off to another room. Shouldn't take two seconds. Oh, and Ease, it was nice catching up with you. Good luck with the whole memory thing. You're going to need it. She nods mutely. Rhombus takes off at a run, then disappears down the hall. Hello, security? I had to flee to room 203, and I can't read the rest of what he just said. Leave the hotel. So, did that... Did we take the higher path here and not have to fight our way out? Is it... HKPF Captain. Oh. The police captain doesn't even bother to look down at you. She waves you off, an irritable expression on her face. Stand back, please. This is a police matter. <laughs> Let's back away slow. Huh. Fair enough. Can we go into any of the buildings or anything? Or any of the, the rooms that we were locked out of? Doesn't look like it. And... Leave DeckCon. Is this the end of the job? You're about to leave this location and return to Hawaii. Continue. Sure. That was anticlimactic. But that was also not at all what we were expecting to run into. I was expecting Rhombus to put up a fight, and then when he said that there was a panic button, I thought we were going to have to fight our way at least down that hallway. But I guess we took the diplomatic route and found out what was really going on here. So Iso has all of her memories locked up in her head, and Rhombus just handed her the key. The bus trip back to Kai Tak is quieter than the, ride in, <laughs> than the ride in was. Your fellow passengers sit crumpled in their seats, barely moving, barely speaking. Their Deccan 2056 t-shirts hang loose on their frames, and their once-cherished guest badges have been crumpled into their pockets. You've seen more lively groups on their way to the morgue. Iso looks up at you, her eyes full of the same post-con fatigue that you see in everyone else's. 
She gives you a small smile and taps her temple with a fingernail. You got what you came for, and the show is over. It's time to go home. Ugh. Now they're all dealing with the post-con blues. I deal with that every time I'm done with a con, too. It just, you're just completely drained and slightly depressed that it's over. Now, we didn't get much money out of that. Are we at least going to get some karma for getting through this without having shot anyone? I at least wanted to shoot that one guy who was trying to uh, get us off that kiosk. Actually, there was quite a few people that I wouldn't have mind shooting, but what's done is done. Ironically, the one person that Sean was supposed to punch seemed to be the nicest and most reasonable out of everyone. I blame the noodle extruder. It's a shame we weren't able to go back there and try and figure out what that was. It would have been nice to have Gobbit there for that. Eight karma. Meet Kindly Chang's friend. We still need to do that quest. And we can level the team. Let's go ahead and level the team here. Gobbit, what do you have available? Augment spell Poison Fog. Gobbit's Poison Fog is upgraded to Acidic Fog, doing AP damage to those affected as well as HP damage. Hmm. Shrine, sp or, uh, Shrine Spirits. Shrine Spirits summoned by Gobbit are now present for an additional turn before dispelling themselves for a total of three rounds. That's a tough one, actually. The thing about it is, Gobbit doesn't have a whole lot of offensive power other than spirits, and if we go into a job where there's not going to be any spirits, and we just have her augmented for it, we're going to be at a disadvantage. So I'll tell you what, I mean, spirits will never break away in the first two rounds after summoning them anyway, so that's kind of cool. So we have a guaranteed window. An extra round would be nice, but I would also like Gobbit to have a nice AoE spell. Poison Fog, Acidic Fog, doing AP damage to those affected as well as HP damage. Let's go ahead and do Poison Fog. See how that goes. Now, Iso. Iso gains a pistol ability. Wait, are we... Oh, that's not what we were using. Sabotage, Augment Weapon, Mini Launcher. Iso's Mini Launcher is now packed with Napalm Charges, igniting damaged targets. Targets on fire will take an additional 6 HP damage. Love the smell of napalm in the morning. Smells like victory. Espionage. Boost program. ISO gains the dual routine boost program, which increases persona speed while sneaking in the matrix by 40%. Does not stack with other boost programs. Well, we do have ISO pretty much specced to, for decking. Persona speed while sneaking in the matrix by 40%. Hmm. Not sure. What we got else here? I'm going to check her level 5 stuff. Gains the Bright Light System Cyber Eye. Capable of temporarily blinding an opponent. Um, Wretch had that in Shadowrun Dragonfall. Cyberware Jolt Alarm System. If the user is brought into a stunned state, they will be jolted awake with 1 AP. Ah. That's cool if we need to get out of the Matrix in a hurry. I'll tell you what, um, dual routine boost program, persona speed while sneaking in the matrix by 40%. Eh. Pistol ability, mark target. Well, we have the pistol ability for the steady shot, so she already had something that has augmented her, her fighting. Let's go ahead and take boost program, because we don't know if we're going to be using it. Probably we will. What you got there, Gunjo? Lethal Force Nail Grenade. Duncan's standard equipment now includes a lethal shrapnel filled grenade. Base damage 12, ongoing 4 damage for 2 rounds. Strips 1 armor from affected targets. That's nice. Modded Flashbang. Duncan's standard equipment now includes a new flashbang that has a larger AoE, increased by 1 tile in all directions. Eh. Duncan's not a flashbang using guy, but that nail grenade sounds awesome. Let's go ahead and get that. Now, Gaichu. Ghoul Bite. Gaichu takes a bite out of his foe, restoring 8 HP over 2 rounds and gaining 1 strength through the consumption of their flesh. Plus 2 HP damage, plus 1 AP damage, cooldown 2. Red Samurai. Coup de Gras. 
Gaichu gains a katana ability plus 100 damage, but can only attack stun targets. Cost 2 AP, cooldown 3. Um, yeah. Coup de Gras sounds awesome, especially if we have abilities that stun. Nice. I think, actually, I'd have some stuff that would stun. Uh, Sean would. Now, Augment Ability Repair. The cooldown on Ractor's Toolkit's repair ability is reduced from 5 rounds to 3 rounds. So we can heal Koshi a little bit faster. And Ractor's Toolkit Overclock Ability now gives the target drone 2 AP and 2 movement for 1 round. I do like the Overclock, but I like the fact that I could repair if needed. Makes him a little bit more of a healer. So I think we'll do that. And we've got a good little selection of abilities here, guys. We'll go ahead and confirm all. Commit ourselves. Now, let's go ahead and spend the karma that I got. Or, <laughs> I got, I got. And right now we have a dodge of four. And a spell cat, our key casting of four. Man, that cyberware affinity still makes me salty. So let's spend the karma, and I think what we're going to do is we're going to spend... We're going to spend five karma on key casting. Because that's going to increase it so we can get some more spells. We can equip Counter-Strike at that point. And equip Martial Defense 1. And then two attacks on a single target with a sword. That's nice, but it doesn't really matter much. All right. Let's go ahead, and we have three available. We'll save that for dodge a five. Good, good. Now, chances are good that everyone here has new stuff to talk about, so I do want to get some stuff that we're missing. So let's... As you pass in front of the walled city, something takes hold of your chest and squeezes. An internal pang, like a panic attack, but worse. You feel your chest compress, and for a second, the world turns to liquid. It takes all the effort you can muster to keep them from falling over. A strobing patchwork of images flashes before your eyes. Fragments of dreams and sense memory all stitched together, playing on a loop in your head. Walled city residents kneeling, the churning sounds of grinding gears, leaning buildings, soiled streets, used needles on a sidewalk. The images come faster and faster. Teeth. Thousands and thousands of teeth. The Redmond Barons and the first man you ever saw killed. A crown of ivory over a shimmering veil. Duncan at age 10, his legs pumping, running for his life from a pack of Halloweeners. Strange anatomy that doesn't make sense to your logical mind. A door, a heavy industrial door. Something is written on it in faded yellow paint, but you can't make it out. And just like that, the slideshow ends. The images fade to nothing, returning you to the Hoi streets. The outermost facade of the walled city towers over you, huge and oppressive. A group of kindly Chang's blue lanterns pass you by, oblivious to the event that just took place in your head. Ew. Let's try and walk it off there, Sean. You take a step forward, then another. You still feel woozy, but you don't need to take a knee. The event, whatever it was, is over, and your mind is your own. Well, that's pleasant. Let's go ahead and uh, go find Spider. See if we can get some new monk stuff and see if the vendors have anything new to say. Hello, ma'am. The area behind Shen's table is even more cluttered than usual. Cool, so everything, d everyone does have something new to say. Many of the glass cages have been pulled out of their neatly arranged stacks, lying about the floor of the boat like miniature reptilian landmines. Shen is busy checking each cage, marking the contents on a comm link. Be with you in a second, just seeing if an order is complete. Ball python, check. Asian kneel or keelback, check. Mexican vine snake, check. The Indian egg eating snake's there too, good. Looks like everything's here. Shen nods in satisfaction, placing the comm link down on the table in front of you. Right then, what can I do for you? I thought you didn't sell your animals. I don't. Especially not the venomous ones. But this is different. 
I'm brokering a deal between a reptile wholesaler and a friend of mine who needs a lot of snakes for his next trid production. Shen plants a foot atop one cage, smiling broadly. Ever heard of a man by the name of Dr. Shen Yang? Yeah, actually. He contacted me about a job. Mark my words. Whatever he wants you to do, it'll be strange. I have no idea where he comes up with his ideas, but I'm fairly certain he finds them at the bottom of the cheapest bottles of whiskey he can find. Smirking, Shen chuckles. Strange guy, but he pays well. So these snakes are for his next Trid movie. I think he's calling it Martian Snake Witches of the Fourth Reich. It's something ter some terrible science fiction movie about time-traveling wizards from the future. That sounds amazing. I'd watch that in a heartbeat. Shrugging, Shen throws both hands into the air. God knows where he gets the funding for these ideas. They sure don't sell for crap. So he Shadowrun's version of Ed Wu. Or Ed Wood. Ed Wood, not Ed Wu. This one time, he wanted to make a trid show starring me, White Ming, and the rest of our crew. It was going to be about daily life in the triad, but he wanted to make it a sitcom. I don't really know what's so comedic about extortion, racketeering, and assault, but that's his strange little brain for you. Let me see what you got here. Anything new on the armor front? Or... Nope. But we can get some key casting. We've got Counter Strike, which is a thousand. And there was something else Martial Defense. Yes. Gains light cover bonus against incoming attacks for four rounds. So we'll definitely get that. And Counter Strike. We will confirm. So our next job needs to be about money, I'm thinking. We got Killing Hands. We need that. Movement increased by two. That's a passive. Medium cover bonus to magic spells. That's good. Manifest. And zero. I need more slots in the spell book, man. There's the nerve strike. There's the martial defense. Hmm. Adept ends their turn, but will counterattack with their current weapon when attacked. Maximum of three counterattacks per turn. That is really good defensive power. We'll go ahead and leave these um, basically in stasis, and we'll deal with this on our next job. Yeah, you keep sa safe there, Shen. Now, out of curiosity, well, we need to make the rounds here, don't we? I don't want to do Club 88 just yet. Let's go ahead and talk to 10-Armed Ambrose and see what's cooking. I also want to see uh, how our uh, relative drone dealer is having to do with after we basically exposed his issue. Ambrose looks rougher and more tired than usual. These dreams are getting out of hand, Sean. You got them too, right? I normally wake up more tired than I fell asleep, but this is nuts. So, after you got smashed up, how did you become a street doc? I know that is in no way related to what you just said, but... Ambrose's face becomes grim. You want to keep going with this, Sean? Alright. After that ambush, things were desperate for a long time. We had to borrow a lot of money. Karen had blown ears and a brain injury, and I was a chunk of raw meat. I was so bad, I was almost euthanized. Trek, I wanted to be put down. Then, we turned the tide. Hmm. Oh wait, before you continue, why didn't they euthanize you? Because of Karen. She raised holy hell about it. She was trans-Catholic, and they're dead set against suicide. To them, it's the worst sin. See, they think we're all incarnate to do our life's karmic work. No matter how dreck that work is, all others being in the huh, all other beings in the universe rely upon us to finish it. So we must see our lives through. Personally, I don't buy it. I just can't believe the universe is that cruel. Ambrose shakes his head in exasperation. Karen Karen was a walking contradiction. She had high aspirations, but she was terrible at all that thou shall not kill or steal or throw people off subway platform stuff. That's my favorite commandment. 
She was her Ambrose rolls his eyes and gives a strained grin. She was like, Ambrose, if you smoke yourself, I will hunt you down in your next life and gut you. I felt I owed it to her to live. That was the first time I felt like I owed anything to anyone. His face clouds with anger and hurt. And then what she did to me. Unfracking believable. What did Karen do? That's a raw nerve, Sean. Ambrose's brow draws low. He glances with intense anger towards the operating table for a moment. Karen betrayed me. I don't want to talk about it. No, you will. Soon you will spill all your secrets to me. But how did you pay all that money back? Now I'm getting to that. Short answer is, I'm still paying it back. But I'm gaining ground. Tell you what though, it's not the money that's hard. It's the favors. I owe kindly so many favors, I'll probably never pay them all off. This clinic lets me do a lot of things I like, but I also have to do some things I don't like at all. Don't ask about that. I, I can't tell you. I don't want to be, like, mean to him, because that sounds kind of prickish, but... How did you turn the tide? Land the plane, Ambrose. I'm in a hurry. Our hall had a really high-grade medical program in it and I figured out a wild kludge to run it on my cyber. We borrowed a bunch of money from Kindly and Kafi Tribe to set up Chrome Alley. The rest is history. I thought we'd make a killing. He looks proudly around at the medical clinic come some machine shop. Maybe it's not a killing, but it's turned out to be a pretty good life. Hmm. Don't you worry about the program's owners coming after you? Hey, I worry about a lot of people coming after me. Nobody ever really gets out of the shadows, but my trail is cold. I've had this thing for five years now. Ripshot is dead. Ten-armed Ambrose lives here now. Good deal. Alright. Cheers, boss. So maybe that corporation is going to come back and go after Ambrose, and that'll be the job that we have to do for him. Uh... Do we want to go ahead and talk to Law? Well, we've got to pass him on the way. Maybe we can sell him some info. Get a little help. To our pocketbook, which we definitely need. Yo, Sean! Law's voice is gregarious, yet tinged with awe. He smiles widely. How can I style out the carnivore? What you need? Got some metadata for you. Oh, you tell me what you got. Network runs on information. Oh, I don't have anything for him. Nice. Never mind. I guess the thing with ISO is pretty much kept to a minimum. Well, it's not really that important either in terms of the grand spectrum of things. So I can see why it's not a priority. <laughs> Eventually, we will see Kindly's friend. I promise. But right now, I want to see what's going on here with Reliable Matthew. Sean, here's looking at you. Reliable Matthew gives you a big wink and shooter sign. His eyes don't seem to reflect the emotion, as usual. You in the market for a high-powered grade-A autonomous helpers? Or are you just here to hang out? Because if you're just here to hang out... Matthew's synthetic personality seems to flicker for a moment. His expression pulses back and forth between swarmy cheer and something like shy happiness. That'd be okay by me. Hmm. I'm just hanging, Matthew. It's good to see you. Right on, beautiful. Right on. Reliable Matthew smiles blissfully, looking around at the docks. He admires the looming, oppressive mass of the walled city. Take your time. Make yourself at home. I'll be right here if you need anything. He flashes you a big smile, exaggerated and fake looking, yet somehow genuine. It's good having you around. Oh, so we've kind of made headway here. Reliable Matthew stands quietly, cheap suit wet with the rain. Tapping his foot absently to the smooth jazz pervading the lot, a halo of cigar smoke surrounds him. Hey beautiful, good to see you. Let's set you up, shall we? Let's, now let's set the tone a little bit low. Let's talk more about your medicine. 
Matthew playfully blows the smoke of his cigar. <laughs> My medicine? I can't think of a thing to talk about, except how nice it is to see you. Nothing but blue skies over here, beautiful. Can you unchip? I'd like to talk to you. He sighs heavily through his plastic grin. All right, beautiful. All right. Clutching his cigar tensely between his fingers, he reaches up into his hair, and with a faint click, he removes a chip. His expression goes slack and his shoulders slump. Matthew struggles to maintain eye contact as a slow tide of melancholy washes over his face. It's like night and day. Hi, Sean. He says it timidly. He looks around disconsolidatedly at the drone-scattered deck. Here we are. Thanks for showing up. It's good to see you again. Matthew just stares at his feet for a long time, then mumbles quietly, still looking down. I don't want to be here, Sean. I, I don't want any of this. He lifts his head and looks you in the eye, tentatively, but with a certain conviction. I know what people think. Some people like Ambrose don't look down on me, but everyone else... I just want them to leave me alone. I want to be left alone, okay? Hmm. And see, there's nothing we can do about it because it's his condition is so different from everyone else's. It's okay, friend. I understand. You can go back now. Thanks for being real for a minute. Thanks, Sean. He gives you a shy nod. There's a deep recognition in his eyes. I know what I'm doing. I'm going back now. Matthew reaches up into his hair. There's a faint click as he snaps a BTL back into his data jack. His back ripples as he pulls himself upright and his face transforms with a sudden surge of feeling. Sean! That was real. I mean, real beautiful. You've got some chops on you. Woo! He adjusts his tie with an exaggerated gusto. You know... Something I think about, may I tell you, it's going to blow your socks. Sure, Matthew, go ahead. You're a peach, beautiful. So, let's get real. Really real. Matthew takes a big, virile breath. He looks around in satisfaction, hands on his hips. I'm not Matthew Shun, and I'm not Cool Blue Jazz. I'm both. He cocks an eye out you. I think a lot about where I'm from. Some coked up dude on a sim rig, recording his feelings, mass produced in a factory, shipped out like a commodity. And this other poor guy, on a slowly sinking, gasoline reeking drone lot, called a merchant of poverty by his neighbors, alone with his drones, the moldy smell of his trailer. It makes me angry, Sean. Angry about this heartless, dreck heap that calls itself meta-humanity. But it also makes me proud. Hmm... Where are you going with this? Reliable Matthew taps himself forcefully on the chest. I'm proud because I'm more than the sum of my parts. Whatever aimless tweaker my feelings came from, they merge with a guy who never had a chance, and they alleviate his pain. I live a life of honor. He looks around at the looming walled city, the polluted river, and the dilapidated drone yard. <laughs> I'm like a knight errant, a Euxia. I'm like the swordsman of Jiadao. I fight for humanity. Thanks for reaching out to Matthew. Don't you worry. I'm watching out for him. Reliable Matthew nods in slow satisfaction, a wizened look on his face. As long as there's chips, I won't get tired. I'll never leave. He claps his hands together and breaks into a gigantic grin. Now, let's get back to it, beautiful. Hmm. Well, thanks for laying it out. I think we understand each other. Me too, Sean. Me too. It's a real pleasure being real. Uh-huh. Oh, we gained karma from that. He breaks out a fresh cigar and rips off the auto igniter with gusto. It bursts to life in a puff of rank blue smoke. He regards you with a sly, exaggerated smile. Now, my honorable brethren in arms, how can I brighten your day? Goodbye, Matthew. So essentially, I've come to the conclusion, he's pretty much a symbiote. 
there's not a whole lot of the real person. So it's kind of like the BTLs, as sad as this is, complete his personality. Otherwise, he'd probably kill himself. It's very weird. And who are you? I just noticed you. I guess you're looking around the drone lot. But we got karma from that, so I guess we made the right call. Or at least took it the right direction. We've been doing a lot this episode. But I'm going to go ahead and end it here, guys. We'll talk to the rest of the vendors and people here in Hawaii in the next episode. And then we'll head into the boat and, you know, get everything else sorted. Hope you guys have enjoyed it. If you liked the video, go ahead and click like down below. Subscribe to the channel. Leave a comment. That'd be a big help. And we'll see you next time. Later days, everyone.